coming. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Russian culture from a perspective that we don't usually see. We're going to talk about Russian culture as the result of centuries of convergence and conflict and coming together of different types of people from different corners of this very large uh, landmass. And we're going to look at works of literature from indigenous writers and theater performances by Central Asian labor migrants uh, in order to come closer to understanding uh, contemporary issues of power, identity, changing socioeconomic situations, and uh, civil rights in Russia today. Uh, and in doing this, my overall hope is that we can uh, use this view of Russia in order to reflect further on the ways that uh, these issues might manifest themselves in our country, in our communities. But first, let's talk a little bit. First, let's talk a little bit about this uh, vast territory of Russia and the former Soviet Union. So the first thing we should probably get out of the way is exactly how diverse Russia is. Uh, the territory of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union uh, encompasses well near one sixth of the world's surface and it's an, an incredibly diverse place. Uh, board, Russia today borders 14 countries as far away from each other as Norway and China. Uh, Russia is understood commonly as the bridge between Europe and Asia. There's an array of different uh, ethnic groups and language families and climates and ecosystems and economic activity that has spanned this territory for as long as it has existed. Uh, and so we don't often think about Russia as being a melting pot of different cultures, but in reality it has been a melting pot of different cultures simmering together for centuries. And the results of this, uh, this melting and this conversion of different cultures are manifesting themselves in the text that we're going to look at today. Uh, so we can note also that uh, Russia is home, in addition to uh, having over 190 languages spoken just within the territory of Russia. Um, it's also home to most of the world's main religions, including uh, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Judaism. Uh, and in order to understand the literature coming from Russian minority groups today, it's important to go a little bit back in history. We're going to go back as far as the Soviet Union in order to understand where the writers that we're going to look at today are coming from. So um, the Soviet Union was characterized by the historian Terry Martin as a kind of affirmative action empire. Uh, it was a Following the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution, uh, Soviet politicians enacted an absolutely massive, expansive series of reforms that were meant to create a new, equal, multicultural society founded on communist principles. And uh, some aspects of this affirmative action empire, this, this uh, attempt to reverse the inequalities of the past and establish a new and bright future uh, for all of the Soviet Union's people, uh, took the following forms. So uh, minority groups were given political autonomy. Uh, and the largest minority groups in the Soviet Union were even given their own national republics. And so this in, in involved a very complicated process of drawing borders and deciding uh, who should speak what language and deciding who belonged to which ethnic group and where they should live. This is not a small undertaking. Um, the, the second goal, uh, in addition to uh, drawing these national borders and giving people uh, autonomy, was also developing the entire country economically. And so uh, along with these uh, this, these drawings of national borders, sweeping economic reforms that were dictated by uh, the central government in Moscow changed irrevocably life for people on the periphery of the Soviet Union. Um, some of these uh, some some of the ways that these policies changed life were. Um, 
targeting religion. So there were massive anti-veiling campaigns by which uh, new Soviet women were encouraged to throw off the burdens of the past and throw off their traditional cultures in order to embrace communism and a new empowerment for themselves and their communities. Uh, the use of people's native languages was actually promoted. Uh, and industrialization and collectiv collectivization of agriculture and uh, other subsistence herding and hunting and gathering practices uh, changed not only the way that people um, understood themselves and their place in the country, but also the very uh, substance of their life, the way they were able to make a living and the way they were able to uh, uh, interact with uh, with each other changed. So I'm going to have you. We're going to look just at a few propaganda posters from this era, the era of the Soviet Union, the affirmative action empire, in order to get an idea of um, what kinds of principles are at work here. So this is a poster from Soviet Turkestan, uh, which urges, which uh, claims that literacy will open up the world to people. We can note here that. Um, the Arabic alphabet at this point in the 1920s is still being used, but it's also being uh, used at the same time as Latin alphabet. So uh, one of the one of the important parts of these uh, reforms were that native languages should be modernized and they should be reformed in order to better express Soviet realities. And this is something that we're going to see coming out. Another poster uh, champions the benefits of collectivization of agriculture, which in uh, Soviet Central Asia often involved, uh, well, it involved the introduction of monoculture, particularly cotton in Uzbekistan, where this poster comes from. And here we can see a progressive uh, Uzbek collective farmer uh, gaining progress through new technology and uh, leaving the religious past behind. And here it's also important to note that we've moved completely to the Latin alphabet in this poster with a Russian subtitle. So now uh, peoples of Central Asia are moving even closer towards Russification, which is coming in tandem with Sovietization. So we're going to return to Central Asia a little bit later in the talk, but for now I'd like to uh, move us a little bit farther north to indigenous Russia. So uh, just like uh, minority groups from all over the Soviet Union, indigenous people were likewise Sovietized, collectivized, and nativized. They were encouraged to use their own native language and to develop writing systems that for some, uh, for some cultures were the very first manifestation of written language. Uh, also, indigenous people in the Soviet Union gained their official legal civil status as indigenous groups during this period of uh, what Terry Martin calls the Affirmative Action Empire. They received the official designation of the small numbered peoples of the north uh, of Siberia and of the Far East. And At the same time that these uh, reforms were being enacted, literature by indigenous writers starts to appear. Uh, printing presses start to appear. Local writers begin to uh, write in their own native languages. One example that I want to share with you is from the research project that I, uh, that I undertook this summer. It's a book from 1925 called The Red Shaman by a Yakut writer named Platon Nayunsky. Uh, what's interesting about this book is that it's written in a modified Latin script, which Oyunsky himself uh, was involved in creating. And this is also a very short-lived Latin script. Uh, not too long after this book was published, uh, policies in the Soviet Union towards language changed in favor of adopting the Cyrillic alphabet, which was one step closer to uh, Russification of indigenous peoples. So um, the genre of this 
work of literature is also interesting because it's uh, nearly impossible to place it within any of the categories that we use in Western literature. It is written somewhat like a play, but the events of this work of literature uh, proceed similarly to a shamanistic ritual. The main character, the red shaman, who's a representative of communism, uh, enacts uh, a ritual throughout this text. And uh, so it doesn't necessarily fit into our ways of, uh, into our um, categories of literature. The red shaman, the titular character, brings about communism, conjures a new way of life at the end of this ritual. Uh, but importantly, this is a way of life that is actually obsolete in, uh, the, in this new world. And so the end of uh, Oyunsky's work is uh, significant in that the red shaman actually renounces shamanism at the end. He takes his shaman shamanic uh, objects and his costume and he burns these, uh, these objects in a fire in order for a new communist world to emerge. So uh, we can note that in this work, the red shaman invokes the revolution. He brings about the revolution in a new communist world, but it's also a kind of suicide. He also brings about his own end through this process. And we can, uh, we can view this work as a foreshadowing of the events in Oyunsky's own life, in the life of the author. Um, he was a very successful writer in the early days following the revolution, but in 1938, he was, uh, he was arrested and charged with a bourgeois nationalist counter-revolutionary organization under Stalin and was imprisoned and died. So starting in the 1930s, starting at around the time Pavel Oyunsky, the author of The Red Shaman, uh, was repressed, Russification and Sovietization began to become one and the same. So this process, um, processes of collectivization uh, and of integration into the larger Soviet industrial economy and integration into Russian systems of education, resulted in great losses of traditional cultures, which is not to mention also a, a great human toll that these, uh, that these events created for people. So uh, indigenous workers were collectivized and representatives from indigenous communities were, um, were taken to boarding schools and to special institutes uh, whose purpose was to create Soviet citizens. So this image here is a group of students at the Institute for the Peoples of the Small Numbered Peoples of the North. This is where uh, this was a an institute that was built in conjunction with an ethnography and linguistics department in St. Petersburg. And uh, these best and brightest uh, representatives of indigenous communities were educated and also acted as uh, informants about their own native communities. So they were, re they were subjects of research at the same time that they were uh, receiving an education. And this institute is significant in the development of literature because nearly every indigenous writer of the next generation that came out of this uh, environment began to write in Russian. So the next generation of indigenous writers uh, were to a very significant degree Sovietized and Russified. And it's exactly this process of Russification and Sovietization that they um, respond to in their works. And as the Soviet Union's uh, control over free speech waned in the 1980s, uh, and as the Soviet state itself completely disintegrated in the 1990s, uh, writers from this generation also became activists. They began to voice their disenchantment with uh, the 
cultural erasure that had occurred in the early years of the Soviet Union. So the first writer that I want to talk about in this context is uh, Askol Barzhanov. He's a Sami writer from uh, the Russian Kola Peninsula, which is an area that borders Norway and Sweden. It's above the Arctic Circle. Um, Barzhanov's poem, How They Loved Us Half Savages, uh, is a scathing critique of the psychological and emotional toll of Soviet processes on indigenous peoples. Um, in particular, his, uh, his note that there's no returning to the traditional um, to the traditional way of life for himself or his community. And this is a great point of uh, disappointment and shame is, uh, is evidence of the, the way that indigenous writers came to critique the very processes by which they uh, came to write literature in the first place. Another writer that I want to mention is the Chukchi writer Yuri Retko. Uh, he's from a different corner of Russia. He's from a part of Russia that uh, is actually closer to Alaska than Moscow. He, uh, just like Bajanov, is a graduate of the Institute of the Small Numbered Peoples of the North. Uh, he is a Russophone writer. He writes in the Russian language, not the Chukchi language. And uh, I'm going to show you just a small excerpt from one of his novels entitled The Chukchi Bible, uh, which provides a, a really epic history of the Chukchi people from uh, the perspective of the Chukchis themselves. So he rewrites Chukchi history with the Chukchi at the center, uh, beginning all the way with the foundation myth and continuing through the Soviet era to the present. And in Retkao's na narrative, the Russians themselves are the ones who are the outsiders, who are the ones who come from the edge of the world, who are backwards, who are impossible to comprehend. So this is an excerpt from the, that depicts the very first encounter between the Chukchi and the Russians. The villagers watched the strange looking humans scatter from the enormous black monsters like maggots from a cured chunk of walrus meat. Neither their looks nor their clothing brought to mind anything seen or heard before. They had faces like animals covered in bristles up to the eyes, and their speech too was more akin to wolfish growling, walrus snorting, or the cawing of crows. They spoke to one another so loudly that their voice muffled the sound of the incoming tide. So writers of Ritkao's generation went on to not just become writers, but also to become political activists in the uh, years following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Two writers of note here are Vladimir Sangi, who is a Nikh writer from a population of native people living on the island of Sakhalin, which is just to the north of Japan, if you can imagine that and Yirame Aipin, who's from a, a Uralic group of people. Uh, they were early fa founders and leaders of uh, one of the first non-governmental indigenous rights organizations in Russia, which is, uh, which is called RIPON. So speaking of the confluence of literature and political advocacy. Now I want to introduce you to another group of people that I mentioned a little bit earlier in this talk, and these are um, people from the former Soviet republics of Central Asia. Uh, we're going to go through a few, um, a few of their theater performances in Moscow, and we're going to talk about the subject of labor migration in general. So uh, this is a recent statistic about labor migration to Russia. Uh, Russia is in the unique position as, of being simultaneously one of the world's largest recipient countries of migrants, as well as the source of a very large migrant population. Uh, there were, since the fall of the Soviet Union, there have been large populations of people um, from the former Soviet republics moving into Russia to work and often returning back to their home republics. Uh, but since the early 2000s, migration flows of non-Russians, particularly from the Caucasus and Central Asia, have become more visible. And so as you can see from this chart, a large percentage of the 
uh, of migrants, of labor migrants counted in the most recent Russian census in 2010 are from the republics of Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, these are Central Asian republics, and then also from the Eastern European former Soviet republics of uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. As the Russian economy increasingly depends on their labor, migrants become more visible in Russian public life, and their roles have become more entrenched in Russian society. Uh, this newfound visibility has translated into uh, new views of immigrants and labor migrants in Russian culture, which until recently, uh, as you might imagine, has included more than a little um, uh, This is one uh, such instance of stereotyping that provoked a lot of outrage in Russia. Uh, it's a guide that was published by a Russian NGO um, for the purposes of introducing labor migrants to life in Russia and uh, introducing them to the kinds of bureaucratic and institutional uh, resources that they might have to start their new life as labor migrants. The outrage here came from the fact that uh, the migrants themselves are depicted as anthropomorphized uh, tools, construction tools. So we have a trowel and a paintbrush and a broom uh, and this is the kind of portrayal of migrant workers that the theater performances that I'm going to tell you about next are directly responding to. Another uh, instance of um, the not so understanding uh, portrayal of labor migrants in Russia today is uh, Russia's, Russia's most beloved sketch comedy characters, Ravshan and Jamshud, who uh, star in a very famous Russian sitcom, and predictably the the kind of jokes that surround their antics in the sketch comedy show are mostly based on the fact that they don't speak Russian, they're not educated, and they generally uh, mess up most of the jobs that their uh, employer in ethnic Russian gives to them. So. In recent years, a small theater venue in Moscow has been making significant strides in the represent representation of migrants in the sphere of theater. Uh, the, the performances that I'm going to talk about were um, uh, produced by a venue called Theater Doc, which proposes a documentary aesthetic for theater. And this involves incorporating real stories, accounts from uh, people who have ex uh, ac accounts from migrant workers themselves and people who have uh, experienced discrimination and other um, unpleasant things in Russia. And as indicated in the title of Theater Doc, um, uh, sorry, I lost my place. Um, so it's hosted several productions since 2012 featuring the experiences of migrant workers. And the first one that I want to talk about is the is a play called The Moldovan's War for a Cardboard Box. It was based on uh, the eyewitnesses of several Moldovan migrant workers to a murder. Uh, the entire set consists of cardboard boxes and materials that the migrants' world is made of. And uh, the play details the way that they build new landscapes uh, for themselves in the post-Soviet city and they sustain it, legally or otherwise, via their trade. The second play that I want to talk about is a one-man show by Talgat Bal Batalov entitled Uzbek. It was advertised as belonging to a new genre in theater doc, uh, and this genre is called documentary stand-up. It's a first-person account of a migrant's process of settling in Moscow, and here the promotional poster for the play is uh, even more interesting. It provides a humorous critique of Russia's uneasy relationship with globalization, and it suggests that Moscow is a multicultural city whose landscape is irrevocably altered by cultural encroachments from both East and West. So as you can see, the, the advertisement itself is a uh, the advertisement for the play is a parody of a McDonald's advertisement, and in the place of a Big Mac is uh, a traditional Central Asian um, 
sandwich. The last play that I'm going to talk about is one called Akin Opera. Uh, this is a play whose director, Sevalod Lesovsky, I was able to uh, speak to during my research trip to Moscow. Uh, the title refers to the name for a traditional Central Asian folk bard, an Akin. And uh, the stars of Akin Opera, interestingly, are actual migrant workers themselves. They're workers who hail from uh, the former Soviet Republic of Tajikistan. They were working as performing arts professionals during the Soviet era. And uh, in the early 2000s, they migrated to Russia and began actually working as uh, construction workers and janitors. So their performances consist of Central Asian folk music and Central Asian folk tales interspersed with narrative monologues of their lives as laborers in Moscow. Um, and in doing so, in this kind of hybrid performance, they synthesize folkloric, autobiographical, and documentary elements. Uh, and so the uh, aftermath of Soviet, the Soviet construction of national cultures here clashes with the realities of post-Soviet lived experiences. So I want to return to this idea of Russia and its diversity in my closing remarks. And I want to bring up again this question of what can we learn from paying attention to minority voices in Russian culture? Uh, first of all, we can learn that, um, we can point out that both indigenous writers and uh, indigenous activists and Central Asian migrant performers in their works are attempting to carve out physical and discursive spaces of their own through their work. And in doing so, they challenge our existing assumptions about what Russia is and what Russia is made of. Um, in other words, they challenge what we think about the essence of Russian culture. The migrant performances of uh, the theater dock venue uh, show us a vision of Moscow as a multicultural city whose economy, landscape, and even day-to-day -day function are deeply dependent on the contributions of labor migrants. Uh, and this multicultural mosaic with all of its contradictions, its violence, its hardship, and its relentless hope serves as a microcosm of the Russian experience itself. In the works of indigenous writers, we see the first person accounts of the erasure of traditional cultures, but we also see resilience. We see the ability of people to adapt to hardships with new strategies of survival and even resistance. So there are no easy answers to the issues facing Russia's most vulnerable populations. Um, and there are also no easy explanations or simple characterizations for the re relationship between Russian mainstream culture and that of its minorities. Uh, but the great thing about literature and the arts and the discipline of humanity is that it forces us to confront these issues. It forces us to deal with these issues and think about them. It forces us to see the humanity in others and to see ourselves in the other. And uh, finally, and most importantly, it urges us to find refuge in each other.